Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Well, my sinuses are like really bothering me today. So I know I sound <laughs> monotone more than usual. But y'all have more energy than I do. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we go. So raise your hand if you've ever been in a black church. <laughs> so you know how they, they tell people to like move into the pews? We're going to ask the people on the sidelines to move to the table. That's going to be our, our version. Unless y'all protesting. <laughs> Councilman Virginia, are you, are you going to lead by example? No. <laughs> yes, I got one. Great. All right. Well, good afternoon. My name is <clears throat> Christina Brown. I'm the Community Outreach and Engagement Coordinator for the Cincinnati Human Relations Commission. I'd like to welcome you all to Local Legends Part 2. Uh, this was an initiative that spawned from Council Member Yvette Simpson's uh, wanting to acknowledge uh, local black legends for Black History Month. And we figured that the folks who are being recognized are very iconic, but they're also human. So we want to hear their stories and sort of share in getting to know them behind their many accomplishments. So that's what today is. Uh, we want to thank you for spending your lunch with us. Thank you to Dr. Bryant for giving you lunch. That doesn't happen all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was, I had cracker and waters for you guys, and he, he improved the situation dramatically. Uh, so just to give you a quick overview of what to expect, this is more of a conversation, not a presentation. So think of this as your space. Uh, so we're just hoping today we'll be open and honest. Uh, will, we, will we acknowledge our, our, our black iconic leaders here? We have a tendency to talk about some of the challenges of our institutional racism, oppression, how they're still playing out today. So this, is, this should be a space where we could sort of share our challenges as well as our hopes. Uh, it's conversational and educational. Dr. Bryan is a, is a teacher out here. So he's, this is not a test but you should learn something. <laughs> uh, and yes, we do have a deadline. We have to be out of here by two o'clock so Dr. Bryant can go upstairs to receive his honor from city council, uh, but don't let that limit the topic and it will be as engaging and as interesting as we make it. So that's just an overview of what to expect. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna introduce the senior program manager for the Cincinnati Human Relations Commission or the person who signs my timesheets, uh, Althea Barnett, who will introduce Dr. Bryant and then we will hear his wise words. Please give her a round of applause. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, I haven't had lunch, and so, um, and I keep looking at the food over there, and my stomach keeps looking at the food over there, and when I haven't eaten, then anything could happen. Um, but I have the pleasure of, um, first of all, saying thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon for our second Lunch and Learn. Um, we are excited about this, and as um, you may or may not know, we, we do this, the Cincinnati Human Relations Commission, we do this in collaboration with Council Member Yvette Simpson's office, and so I'm sure she'll pop in at some point, as she normally does, but you know they will have council meeting following this program, so she may be preparing for that. But um, again, I'd like to thank you for coming and to welcome you to this, our second Lunch and Learn. And before I forget, um, we have two more um, coming up. Right. One what? more, <laughs> one more. I know, I'm looking at Christina. Okay. <laughs> we have one more coming up um, next week, so we're hopeful that you will come back and join us next week when um, our honorees will be from King's Records. Um, today, we had two people that we were going to hear from. However, Dr. Murtis Powell, who, was, who is one of our honorees for later on this afternoon, um, could not make it to the Lunch and Learn today. She had a family situation and couldn't make it. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about her um, anyway, so that if you do go upstairs at 2, um, you will have heard um, a little bit about her before you go up. So Dr. Powell's most recent career stop was as the outgoing president and CEO at the Cincinnati Youth Collaborative. Um, Dr. Powell is the first African American to be Associate Dean at the University of Cincinnati. 
She's the first African American to hold an upper management position at Miami University, and she's the first African American to serve as a program officer at the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation in New York City. Now, Dr. Powell climbed the ladder of higher education by taking evening classes and part-time classes at the University of Cincinnati. And believe me, I've been there and I've done that and I know how hard that is. <laughs> so in 1969, she earned a bachelor's degree in administrative management. And in 1974, she earned her master's in sociology. And in 1978, she earned her doctorate in sociology and higher education administration. She also holds a certificate in executive management from the Harvard Business School. So you'll hear more from her and about her again at two o'clock when we are in council chambers. And um, we are just so sorry that she couldn't join us this um, at, at one o'clock today. But our other honoree is here with us. And as has been mentioned before, he is such a kind hearted gentleman. Um, <laughs> You know, bless his heart. He kept saying, where should I go? What should I do? Everybody keeps telling me what to do. And in and, and, and our office, it's pretty much, you know, you fly by the seat of your pants until you figure it out, you know, how to do it. And so um, we're honored to have, um, to, to have Dr. John Bryant here with us this afternoon as, as um, who was going to be our second presenter, but is now our first presenter. Now, Dr. Bryant, um, like Dr. Powell, is also an alumnus of the University of Cincinnati College of Education, and he holds three degrees. He has a Bachelor's of Science in Education, and he taught business education at Withrow High School for eight years. And while doing that, he earned his master's degree in, second, in secondary education. And then he returned to UC as an instructor while pursuing his um, doctoral degree in Education Foundations, which he completed in 1971. Dr. Bryant became a professor of education and chairman of the education department at Wilmington College for 19 years. So you can imagine, he saw a lot of people go through that program, a lot of people. Dr. Bryant extends his dedication to children through involvement on boards and commissions for youth-oriented organizations, including the Cincinnati Children's Museum, Crayons to Computers, Every Child Succeeds, Ohio Reads Council, the Urban Appalachian Council, and Seven Hills Community Neighborhood House. He serves as a valued member of the College of Education Dean's Advisory Board at the University of Cincinnati. So we are so honored to have him here with us this afternoon. And at this time, we are going to turn the floor over to Dr. <laughs> to Dr. Bryan. Um, and he's going to, you know, tell us about um, his trail. And, um, and then following his presentation, then you will have time to ask him some questions. So thank you very much. Oh, mercy. <laughs> Obviously, it is an extreme pleasure and honor uh, for me to be here and to be recognized uh, in this way. Uh, and I was sort of looking forward uh, to being recognized at the same time as Murtis Powell. Uh, now, many of you around the table and or really are, are responsible for my being here uh, because many of you uh, I worked with uh, in various capacities uh, and somehow that caught uh, the notice of somebody uh, and who uh, then said uh, that I should be recognized. Uh, I am going to digress a bit uh, because uh, uh, when I was at Wilmington College, uh, and this goes back to from 1971, uh, basically until the time I left Wilmington College, uh, I brought students uh, from Wilmington College uh, to be uh, introduced 
to an urban environment. Uh, and uh, one of the persons uh, that uh, was kind enough to meet with them, he was, he was a little younger then, uh, and I'm, I don't think he had a beard, uh, and, and not as many flecks of gray. Uh, uh, and uh, he is now uh, Councilman Wendell Young. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to go uh, all the way back to even before that time. Uh, I, I taught at Wilmington College. No, I, I taught at Withrow High School, uh, and uh, one of my students uh, was a young man um, by the name of James Reed, uh, who had the good judgment, and she didn't have such good judgment, uh, but he had the good judgment uh, to uh, marry uh, Eileen Cooper Reed. And Eileen and I uh, have uh, worked together uh, on uh, the Children's Defense Fund, uh, Public Allies, and a number of other uh, things. Uh, in fact, she was my, she was my official boss. Now, she's been my boss uh, <laughs> for as long as I've known her. Uh, uh, but uh, I was a... Uh, uh, part-time employee at the Children's Defense Fund Cincinnati office when she was the uh, head of uh, that office here. Uh, and really the person uh, that uh, goes back uh, longest with me, uh, and I uh, sometimes uh, say uh, that she was my babysitter, <laughs> uh, and I, uh, I met her uh, in uh, 1956, uh, uh, just as I was uh, getting ready to come out of the Army. Uh, so she has been a good friend, a mentor, uh, uh, confidant uh, uh, for all of those years, uh, Jean Brown. And Jean, raise your hand. Uh, he got the dates wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, everything else. <laughs> Was it 1957? <laughs> uh, a, a little bit about my uh, uh, self and, and sort of events along the way. And that tells us something about uh, the city of Cincinnati. Uh, and by the way, I, I, I should mention uh, the uh, Cincinnati Human Relations Commission and what uh, it uh, has uh, done uh, before it was at, at the Human Relations Commission uh, with uh, Mrs. Uh, Coffey. Uh, and then I think there was a, a, a Garner uh, that was, uh, uh, and then probably her father that followed her, and then of course, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Arzell Nelson comes in there, uh, uh, Cecil Thomas. So, so uh, uh, the uh, uh, work that has been done um, by the Human Relations Commission uh, is uh, uh, so, sort of fundamental uh, to uh, where we are and what we are and the good things that are being done today. Uh, in terms of race in Cincinnati, uh, I graduated from Withrow High School uh, in 1954. Uh, when I started at Withrow High School in 1950, uh, white kids uh, swam on Monday through Thursday. And black kids swam on Friday. And I was in many uh, classes in English and history and all that. Uh, where I was the only uh, black kid there. Uh, so when I got to swimming on Wednesday and I was the only black kid there, so no, no big deal, uh, but the uh, instructor took one look at me and said, you're in the wrong class. I said, no, no, here's my, uh, he said, go see your counselor. So I went back to the counselor 
and uh, the uh, counselor uh, changed my schedule to swimming on Friday. Uh, that's when I understood. And it was about midway through uh, my uh, freshman year uh, that two important uh, court decisions were rendered. Uh, one was called Sweat versus Painter, uh, which was uh, in Texas, uh, where uh, the uh, uh, Texas uh, legislator, legislators uh, built a school uh, for African Americans uh, seeking a degree in law uh, that they uh, put in the YMCA uh, in Houston uh, and uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, said there is no way that you can start a law school put it in a YMCA and say that it is equivalent to the University of Texas uh, and uh, uh, not equivalent in terms of the faculty, uh, not in ter uh, equivalent in terms of the library, uh, not equivalent uh, in terms of something that cannot be quite measured, uh, but it is the reputation that the University of Texas Law School has gained over the years uh, so that their alumni will have a network uh, that they uh, can connect to. So uh, no, it is not uh, equivalent. Uh, the other one was uh, McLaren versus Oklahoma, and McLaren was a 68-year-old uh, person uh, seeking a uh, doctorate. Uh, and so the uh, University of Oklahoma said, okay, uh, we're going to admit you. However, you'll have your own separate table in the library. Uh, you'll have your own separate table uh, in the cafeteria. And you'll have your own separate area in classrooms that will be roped off uh, from the other members of the classroom. Uh, and, uh, that, and he was in a, uh, a uh, doctoral program. He said, no, no, this cannot be equivalent. Uh, so uh, therefore, uh, you will have to uh, take down essentially uh, those barriers at that point. Uh, the state of Ohio and the Attorney General uh, made a ruling that based on those two decisions, uh, the kind of in-school segregation uh, that was practiced in Cincinnati was unconstitutional. So we were all called back into a big assembly uh, at Withrow High School and said, okay, based on that, uh, we have to now reassign all of your uh, swimming and gym classes. However, up until that time, uh, swimming was a mandatory course. And now it became elective uh, so that you could take uh, three periods of gym uh, and no swimming uh, because if you did not want to swim in the same water uh, with someone of an opposite color, uh, you would not have to do that. Uh, so uh, that was uh, Withrow High School, not Withrow High School, Cincinnati Public Schools uh, in 19... Uh, of course, uh, those two decisions uh, set the basis, were the basis, uh, for the Brown versus Topeka, Kansas uh, case uh, that came in 1954. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a couple more, uh, and then let's open it up uh, for uh, 
discussion. Uh, I went in the Army out of high school in 1954 uh, and uh, played both uh, basketball and volleyball. That was a better way than doing you know, the other assignments that uh, uh, one had. Uh, and so uh, I got to be fairly good at volleyball, I guess, uh, because uh, the team that I was on from the First Army uh, was selected to play uh, in the All-Army Volleyball Tournament uh, that was held at Fort Bennings in Columbus, Georgia. I happened to be the only African-American on the volleyball team, so we flew from New Jersey uh, to Atlanta, where we had to then take a connecting flight to get from Atlanta to Columbus, Georgia. Uh, so uh, the team walked up to make the connecting flight, uh, and the reservationist took one look at me uh, and said, everybody else can fly on this flight, which was to leave at 9 p.m., except him. I said, wait a minute. You know, he's our teammate. Uh, just like Leslie, I will sit next to him. You know, I'm going to play with him on the court. Uh, and I said, no, 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 you don't understand. Uh, the law in Georgia uh, says uh, that a black person may not sit next to a white person on a flight. And we have a full flight. So therefore, there is no way that you can sit on that flight. Now we got another flight leaving at 2 a.m. Uh, that has some uh, space available uh, where you will be able to have your aisle and all that to yourself. Uh, and you ask, one thing, you know, we all fly to Atlanta now and uh, think uh, nothing of it. Uh, this was in the spring of 1957. And I, you know, I and the rest of us are in our little uh, khaki uniforms and all that. So wait a minute, you don't understand. Uh, this tournament is taking place on the base at Fort Bennings, which is not state controlled by the state by the U.S. military. Uh, so that's why you can play and have a tournament that is, has integrated competition. Uh, you cannot do that in the state of Georgia. And I say that, and I, I talk to other uh, uh, students, uh, uh, college students today. Uh, because then when I got to the University of Cincinnati and I made the volleyball, uh, basketball team and we were getting ready to go uh, to Texas, this is now my sophomore year, Oscar's <coughs> junior year, and Oscar said, John, take some extra money. I said, what do you mean? He said, last year uh, when uh, we got to Houston uh, and walked up to the hotel and they said, you can all stay here except him. And Oscar had to stay on the campus at Texas Southern University, met his teammates the next day, next evening, for the game that was played. So you look out today, uh, and you uh, look at the University of Mississippi and Alabama and uh, Florida and North Carolina and South Carolina, and you say, mercy, where are the white players? Uh-huh. <laughs> and so I, I, when, I, when I talk to the students in the class, and I say, you know, I, I, this is unthinkable to you because that's what you see when you see uh, the uh, television. Uh, how am I doing time-wise? Uh, it's about 1.35. Uh, I'll, I'll take a couple more minutes. Uh, I graduated from uh, Withrow High School uh, in 1960. And 
I don't look that old, do I, Trevor? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about how I was doing the calculations. No. <laughs> uh, so, uh, at that time, uh, there were four of us uh, that integrated the teaching faculty at Withrow High School. Uh, up until 1953, there were no blacks in Cincinnati public teaching at any high school in the Cincinnati Public School District. In fact, if you were to go back a few more years, there were only four schools that any black could teach at. Sherman, Jackson, Stowe, and Douglas. Uh, Sherman, Jackson, and Stowe. Sherman, Jackson, and Jackson were elementary schools that fed into Stowe. They were the feeder schools for, for Stowe. And of course, uh, uh, Douglas uh, was in Walnut Hills. Those were the only schools uh, that blacks could teach at, Cincinnati Public. Uh, and so uh, the first high school was when Taft High School was created and to essentially replace Old Woodward. Old Woodward now became New Woodward. Uh, there are only a couple of us, uh, Councilman Mann. Uh, <laughs> maybe only one of us. You <laughs> I'm not going to admit that. <laughs> uh, so so that, uh, that's uh, the first crack when, when there were four. Uh, I think uh, uh, Willard Stargell, uh, 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 Mr. Conway, I believe, uh, Obadiah Williams, and... Uh, when you get old, you remember that you forget. Three out of four is not bad. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all want your memory. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, uh, that's uh, sort of the uh, uh, history. Uh, and then I actually became the first African American uh, to be a uh, head basketball coach uh, in Cincinnati Public uh, in 1968. 1965, uh, and the first uh, black uh, to be on the coaching staff uh, at uh, the University of Cincinnati in 1968. Uh, that's more than enough. Let's open it up, and, and uh, uh, I will respond as best I can. Uh, and anything I can't remember, Leslie will. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. How did you get out of Atlanta? How did you get out of Atlanta? How did I get out of Atlanta? Uh, the, uh, you took the 2 o'clock flight? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the 2 o'clock flight uh, that had uh, not a full complement, mm -hmm. and so I did not have to sit uh, next to uh, a person who was white, even though my teammates were all white. Uh, and uh, uh, this is now because uh, the time of uh, Rosa Parks, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, all of the kind of issues around transportation, and so uh, I, I know it sounds absolutely ludicrous, um, but the state law that applied. Uh, to Georgia uh, said, no, you may not, <coughs> uh, even though it is public transportation. Mm -hmm. so, so, so you didn't? You went to the earlier flight, and then you went to mm -hmm. the <coughs> Did they think of protest? Uh, uh, LK, uh, you're in the middle of Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> 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 and, and did you want me to to walk back to New Jersey? Yeah, but what, what about your teammates? 
uh, well, what, what are they going to do? Protest. <laughs> you bum rush the plane, <laughs> right. stage a sit in, <laughs> and, and the plane. Yeah. Then, then maybe we'll be celebrating yeah. you instead of Rosa Parks. And and and, uh, and uh, let me uh, uh, give some props to uh, Councilman Mann, who was Representative Mann uh, uh, when uh, I was with the Cincinnati Youth Collaborative, uh, and uh, we had submitted a proposal. Uh, to uh, the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Labor. I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, this has not been uh, scored fairly in the uh, U.S. Department of Education. Uh, said that might be so. Uh, but uh, we're not going uh, to review this at this point in time. It's done. So uh, you're just out of luck, Cincinnati. And so I said, uh, Representative Mann, here are the facts. And it's clear uh, that it's not, uh, they didn't know what they were reading when they scored it. Uh, and he took a look at it, and he said yes. And I think, uh, I can't be, uh, so, so Representative Mann, if you want to correct me. You can test my memory. <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, when uh, it was, the, the concern was taken to the head of the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Labor, they said, uh, yeah, uh, tough luck. And I think uh, Congressman Mann reminded them that they had to come to the Congress seeking funding. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you say, yes, I know. Uh, <coughs> that administrations come and go, but you have to come to Congress to seek funding. And they said, well, I think maybe we can <laughs> take a fresh look at it. Uh, 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 Sherry Westmoreland uh, and Jane Keller, uh, that's why we have <clears throat> an ETS program uh, that uh, we were able to say, here's, here, here's the data that was presented. And it's obvious that the readers didn't understand the data. Uh, plus, uh, there were no freestanding ETS programs, and they were all located on college campuses. And the readers were from college campuses, and they wanted to be able to essentially steer students to their institution. Mm -hmm. uh, by being a freestanding institution, we were able to look at the student and say, what makes the most sense for you? And where are you trying to get to? Uh, and it's our job to help you in that endeavor. And so uh, Council, Council Man, Man, former Representative uh, Man, uh, thank you ever so much uh, for uh, standing strong. It was easy to confuse him when it, for your proposal, so thank you, Rep. Uh, and, and, uh, next question, or do I have to do like I was doing in class and, and <laughs> call on people? <laughs> call on people.
Scott, you hmm? described some of the issues, racial uh, integration, non-integration in the past. What can we bring about today because of the struggle and the situation that you reported on, which were which a few examples of many, many issues in, uh, uh, in the past. I, the transition, wh why are you telling us that today? Uh, one, one of the uh, things uh, that uh, I was involved in that is still going forward, uh, then Supreme Court Justice Thomas Moyer, now deceased, um, but uh, we had a futures commission uh, that was to look out 25 years. Uh, this was uh, in 2000. So we essentially look to the year 2025 and say what ought the court system to look like. Uh, we're 15 years into it uh, and we haven't done very well. Uh, one thing we said was that every element of the court system from the policeman on the beat uh, to the bailiffs uh, to uh, the uh, judges ought to be reflective of the community in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity, uh, we haven't made nearly as much progress there as we need to. Over the next 10 years, to get to 2025, uh, if we could just do that, uh, we ought to be able uh, to reduce uh, the uh, killing by government officials of young people. Uh, the language that we use, and I uh, might have shared this uh, maybe with, uh, with Eileen, uh, uh, that uh, teachers are supposed to be able uh, to teach at-risk students. What do you mean by at-risk? How are they identified? When are they identified? Are you talking about those students in Vermont and New Hampshire who are having heroin use and suicide? Are those the person you're talking about being at risk? You know, what image do you get in your mind when that kind of language is used? What image does the prospective teacher get in their minds? When I'm preparing a uh, student, when I was preparing a student at Wilmington College, and now here's a state re requirement that says these teachers are supposed to be able to teach at-risk students. What are you talking about and what am I to tell them? That's idiocy. And yet, the state did it. Uh, the state did this. N not this state, but it applies to this state. In Flint, Michigan, the state poisoned kids that are going into the classroom and they are all going to be taking the same test and expected to get the same score on that test, you know, the cut score. So wait a minute. You cannot say that that's fair and equitable. Well, and I'll bring it down to Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, in Lower Price Hill, uh, we had industrial pollutants. 
right? Uh, that is impacting the kids at 8th and state and all of that surrounding area. And now we're saying, however, you're going to take the same test that everybody else takes and be expected to get the same score, cut score. That's idiocy. Uh, now, the, the test itself, uh, you can say uh, that uh, the ACT and the SAT uh, is uh, going to be a screening device to get into this particular job or that particular job. Uh, uh, that's different. It's not completely fair and equitable. It has other issues, but that's different. And, 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 and the claim can be made uh, uh, that a mother drinks, takes drugs, uh, and so she poisoned her own child uh, and put her own child at a disadvantage. Okay, I, I, and I'm, I'm willing to recognize that and, and let's deal with it. But that's not to excuse then uh, industrial concerns that are polluting and poisoning and uh, those kids. Uh, yes, sir, De Dennis, go ahead. Uh, the, the fallacy with the, that example that you just gave uh, is that it's, it's only idiocy if those pollutants were introduced with the express uh, desire to cause that poisoning. And my experience suggests to me that that type of thing is more an economic. Well, well you're, you're um, mixing up the two. Uh, so? uh, in terms of, of what the uh, parent uh, might do or the environment that, that the parent might set up. Uh, and uh, that which is done uh, by uh, corporate and uh, governmental entities. Uh, and uh, I would say uh, that neither of them might have intentionally uh, done so. The damage to the child remains the same, right? Yes. Okay. I, I will grant you that. And because this is Black History Month, and I understand that part of why this date was chosen to honor you is because it's Black History Month, and you're black. Well, now hold on a second there. <laughs> hold on a second. Uh, 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 there, there, there are two uh, issues here, uh, and and uh, and because he's my nephew, uh, uh, we we will carry on much of it uh, later. But uh, there, there are. Uh, Hold on a second. Uh, in 1840, uh, William Dawson had eight slaves, three of them under the age of 10. Uh, William Dawson died between 1840 and 1850. He gave his three children under the age of uh, ten to his children. Uh, one of those, Matilda McDill, uh, married uh, Green Massengill. Uh, Green Massengill was a mulatto. Uh, Matilda gave birth uh, to a child before she married. Green Massengill, who was a mulatto. Uh, Green Massengill and uh, Matilda uh, married uh, after slavery in 1868. Uh, and uh, Green Massengill 
and Matilda had a son, John Wesley Massengill. And John Wesley Massengill had a daughter, Jessie Lee Massengill, who married Edgar Bryant. Uh, you know, that's our history. And, uh, and all of a sudden, uh, the decision comes down uh, that uh, what is a black and what is not a black and all of that, and we no longer use the term mulatto uh, because we don't want to hold accountable uh, the uh, white male who impregnated uh, this person uh, exercising his power and influence and all of that. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, Plessy uh, was one-eighth, one-eighth African blood and not discernibly so. Uh, Plessy was arguing that he ought to be able to ride in the white railroad car because it was over railroad cars because it was not discernible except for those persons from that little small town who would know the history. Uh, so this whole question of uh, race and what is race and uh, if you got one quantum thereof and all that, it's idiocy. Uh, 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 I do. I really yeah, hate yeah. to cut uh, you off. And, and, and uh, I, I have to. for another three hours. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And, and I have to take my daughter and give you an assignment. <laughs> because uh, I need you to walk right across the street and either take some coins or put your credit card <laughs> in the identity theft. You better, you better do that. <laughs> okay. And we plug the passport up. One good thing did come out of the argument over parking staff as well. <laughs> So before we conclude to head upstairs, uh, one, I'd like to thank Dr. Bryant. Can we give him a round of applause? <laughs> I am a history nerd, so the fact that you took it back to 1840, like I need to hang out with you on the weekends. <laughs> uh, before we close, I just want to give uh, Council Member Simpson an opportunity to give some words. Uh, this is, like I said, a byproduct of her initiative to honor our local legends. So uh, following her remarks, we invite you immediately to the third floor where Dr. Bryant will be uh, presented with a resolution. So uh, thank you again for being here and Council Member Simpson. All right, I'll be brief because we all want to go upstairs and, and get this um, party um, continued, I guess I should say. I want to thank everybody for coming out. I want to acknowledge um, Vice Mayor Mann and Council Member Young who've joined us. Uh, and everybody who has come today, also former uh, school board member Eileen uh, Cooper-Reed, who I think was acknowledged during the comments. Um, it's an honor to do this every year. I mean, we, we've been doing this for four years, and um, I, was, uh, I was shocked that we didn't recognize more people of color uh, through resolution, which is an official um, vote of council that becomes an official record of proceedings for council forever and always. And I think it's really important for individuals, black or white, or mulatto, or of <laughs> any background, um, who have made a significant contribution to our community to be a part of a permanent record that generations from here on out will be able to, to know. Uh, and we accept um, recommendations. And so this year, I think almost everyone um, that we're honoring this year came from a recommendation outside of my office. So I just want to thank all of those who submitted recommendations. And I know um, Dr. Bryant, because we work together at the Freedom Center. Uh, we were part of the Community Advisory uh, Council together before the Freedom Center was even built. I think they started that group, but right after it was built. Um, and we used to come together and talk about how we um, allow the community, encourage the community to take advantage of the amazing asset that we have on the river. So I haven't seen him in a while, and so it's such an honor. Um, I haven't changed, though, have I? You've not changed a bit, <laughs> not aged a day, not even. Um, someone who I think is probably one of our best kept secrets. 
um, an amazing giant in the field of education and, and improving the lives of our young people. Um, and we're going to be joined upstairs by Dr. Mertis Powell, who has a similar legacy. And so it's just always a treat um, to honor individuals who probably are in the shadows more than they should. Uh, and I always learn something more about these amazing giants when we put these resolutions together and certainly these lunches. And so I want to thank CHRC for being an amazing partner on the Lunch and Learn series and all of you for coming out. And so I think at this point we'll go upstairs and uh, begin the meeting and we will be able to then have uh, Dr. Bryant, Dr. Powell come forward and embarrass you a bit with the honor that we're going to give you, make you blush a bit. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>